policies that I received actually include some of the model language that you all have included in the board report in the past. Um, so I thought you all might be pleased to know that they are listening and um, we're all working together to make this better. So um, lastly, uh, I included in each of the agency's paragraphs as well, some information about supervisory review. This should be in every single um, wave one and wave two agency to the extent that it was shared to me and I was able to find that information. Um, but those are all of the updates that were made to this section of the report so far. And I'm happy to take questions or comments if anyone has any. Are there any questions for Dominique? Oh, it looks like um, board member Kajabi, but we can't hear you. Still can't hear you, no. Um, maybe uh, if it doesn't work itself out in the next couple minutes, when we do the discussion of the full report, does that is that okay? Okay, any other questions? Dominique. All right, I understand that um, Kevin Walker from the Department of Justice is also going to do a presentation on job data. Kevin? That concludes our subcommittee reports, I should say. Great. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. So, hi, um, I'm Kevin Walker. I'm a research associate at the California Department of Justice Research Center. I'm actually joined today too by uh, Dr. Trent Simmons, who's another research associate. Um, so we're gonna be handling the presentation um, together. Um, so here I will we have a presentation. It's going to go over the um, stock data section at, of the draft as currently written. Um, I'll note that it is still in draft form and that we are still making revisions and we're going to be adding more information to it and making revisions based on the discussion both here today at this meeting as well as in the stock data subcommittee meeting that'll occur between now and the next full board meeting. Here I will um, share my screen. Started with the presentation. Okay. Is everyone seeing the PowerPoint? My view is different from this view. I'm going to assume that that's a yes. Um, great. So Trent and I will be going over a, a few items uh, related to the stock data draft. Um, we'll be going over some stock data demographics and outcomes based on the 2019 data. Uh, Trent will go over some of the pest disparities that we've included in this year's report um, thus far. Um, and I'll go over some of the intersectional analyses that we've included as in, in response to some of the comments that we received from board members and members of the public towards the end of the 2020 report reporting period. Um, and then we'll go over some next steps and things that we're still working on. And of course, our next steps will uh, uh, be informed by the discussion. So uh, as a first um, item in this presentation, uh, I figured I'd go over some of the structural changes that we've made thus far to the report in contrast to the first year's report that included data analysis. And so in the first report, of course, we were dealing with six months of data from the eight largest agencies that state that were reported in 2018. This year, by contrast, we have a full, uh, a full uh, reporting period of one year, uh, calendar year of 2019, to evaluate it, and as well as this, agent, this information was collected from 15 of the largest agencies. So we have more data, which is great this year. Um, the second uh, difference uh, is last year we included a technical report that was mainly used to put a lot of the analyses where we're examining the identity groups other than race, ethnicity. So we can include that in the report, but it was kind of a separate report from the main body of the report. Um, and so this year we've, from the beginning, been working on incorporating analyses that break down outcomes by all six of the identity groups in the main body of the report. And so. Um, as you flip through, you'll notice that there are a lot more mentions to the other identity groups, um, such as gender, et cetera. Um, next, uh, the tests that were included last year included some benchmark comparisons, veil of darkness, and discovery rate comparisons, uh, search discovery rate comparisons. Uh, this year, we've adopted similar approaches of uh, benchmark comparisons via the discovery rate comparisons, but in addition to those, um, 
we're expanding the types of analyses that we include to also uh, cover some issues related to use of force. And then also we've added this intersectional piece where we do some discovery rates um, and examine them by the intersections of a couple different um, identity groups. And so um, that is the first step down the road of looking at some of the intersectional pieces. And then uh, lastly, uh, we received a lot of feedback last year about some of the technical discussions that occurred in the main body of the report and how it made the soft data analysis section very long to read um, and that uh, various analyses had largely different amounts of space within the report dedicated to them. And so in response to that type of feedback, we actually have taken it, uh, taken an approach from the Connecticut Racial Profiling Prohibition Advisory Board. Um, Connecticut Racial Pro Profiling Prohibition Project Advisory Board, which is a similar uh, advisory board to the Ripple Board, but in Connecticut, has actually provided a, a bit of feedback to us at the beginning of this year and the end of last year. And so we've taken a, a page out of their playbook where they they have a dedicated methodology in their uh, dedicated methodology appendix in their annual report. And so we've actually created a similar uh, appendix so that we can still have those discussions for people who are interested in reading into the details of the methodology that's employed in the report, but without um, making the actual report section um, much longer than some people would like to read through. So um, with all that said, those are the major differences this year in the structure of the report. And we're hoping that people um, like some of those changes. Of course, we're always open to feedback about structural change, but um, and so to get into some of the information from uh, the 2019 data. So here we see the number of stops reported by agency. Overall, um, in 2019, agencies reported making just shy of 4 million stops in the submitted records for all of the stops. And so uh, we see here again that CHP uh, submitted a majority of these top data records for the 2019 reporting period. Um, and then they were followed uh, by Los Angeles Police Department and Los Angeles Sheriff's Departments with the next two closest numbers to CHP. Uh, Los Angeles PD with 700, over 700,000 stops conducted. And then we have the introduction of some of the uh, Wave 2 agencies that began collecting for the first time in 2019. And we see that a Wave 2 agency, Oakland Police Department, was the agency that kind of was the other end cap of the distribution here with 24,000 records submitted in 2019. Um, here uh, we have a breakdown of a few of the identity groups. Um, I'll remind everyone, people who are new to the uh, project, that um, these identity group uh, data categories are collected based on the perception of the officer that enters the stock data. Um, the, the governing section of the government code that governs RIPA requires the officers report their perception of stock individuals rather than uh, asking the individuals to self-identify on these characteristics. And so again here, um, we see that the single race ethnicity group uh, that constitutes the largest proportion of stopped individuals in the 2019 data is Hispanic individuals uh, followed by white individuals with 33%, black individuals next with just shy of 16%, Asian individuals after that 5.7%, Middle Eastern and South Asian individuals with just shy of five, and then uh, the last three racial ethnicity groups, um, uh, multiracial individuals, Pacific Islander individuals, and Native less than 1% of the data. Um, for gender, uh, we see that a majority of the individuals that officers stopped, they perceive to be cisgender male um, at 71%, uh, followed by cisgender female um, at 28.6%, and then together in aggregate individuals that officers perceive to be either, um, and these are the terms from the regulations, um, gender nonconforming, uh, transgender man, boy, and transgender woman, girl. Um, to be about together 0.2% of stopped individuals. Uh, and lastly, for this slide, we see the age distribution here. Um, and we see that the uh, age category with the most stopped individuals in, in 2019, the 25 to 34 uh, age group, followed by 35 to 44, and now from there. Kevin, this is the Allison. Last three. Um Kevin, I don't know if you can hear me. Are you able to change the slide view? Um, because right now it's showing both the main slide and the next slide. So um, we are getting some chat. Oh, yes. Let me. Just so people are yeah, able to. Yeah, let me. Let me stop sharing. Kevin, if, you put, it, close. if you put it in slideshow mode, it should work. I was in slideshow mode. What I'm going to do is. Um, 
go back in and share my other screen. I have a dual monitor set up right now, so it was just showing my left monitor, which didn't have that. So I'm just going to set it up to show my right monitor instead. And then that hopefully will solve the issue. Uh, let's see. I'll share my screen. Open my second screen, and then I'll go back in and do another one. Let me know if this is going to solve our issue. Does it? Is the big view now? Yes, that is much better. Thank you. Oh, all right. I'm, I, yeah, sorry about that. I, I when I when we tested this last week, I wasn't using both of my monitors, and so this didn't come. I apologize. And I also just thank you. And I also just want to let people know because we are getting comments in the chat box. You can also, um, at the bottom right of my screen, you can enlarge your screen as well. Um, there's a box with two arrows in the corner. So if you click on that, you can also enlarge your screen to take up your whole monitor screen, and that may help with the visual as well. Sorry to interrupt you, Kevin, but we were getting a few comments, so I just wanted to try to fix it before you finished. Thank you. Yeah, no big deal. Um, people hopefully can see better now. Some of these slides have a lot of information on them, so it's important that people be able to view it. Um, great. So, uh, and then so we have some information here about uh, individuals perceived to have disabilities. Officers perceive 1.1% of individuals that they stop to possess a disability. Um, and it's worth noting here that of this 1.1% of individuals perceived to have a disability, a majority of those individuals were perceived to have a mental health condition. Um, that being 68% of this 1.1%. Um, so, and then uh, officers perceived 0.7% uh, of individuals that they stopped to be uh, lesbian, gay, sexual, or transgender. And they perceived 4.1% of individuals they stopped to either possess limited or no English fluency. So next year, I'll briefly go through a few slides here and I'll note before we go in here that there's far more information in the actual draft. Um, and we're gonna uh, we wanna leave time for discussion and so we're not gonna have time to delve into all of the different types of analyses we've done in the draft, but each of these distributions that I'll go over the next few slides um, are broken down by each of the six identity groups that we just covered in the report draft as it currently stands. And so we encourage people to take a look at that as well. And this is not going to reflect all of that, and that's just in the interest of time and allowing time for discussion. So, but here we see again this year, people with, familiar with last year's report will remember that uh, we saw a similar distribution in the primary reason for stop that officers report. Um, officers mainly reported the primary reason for making stops to be traffic violations, followed by reasonable suspicion that the person was engaged in criminal activity. And then uh, the other six reason for stop categories together in aggregate constituted uh, just shy of 3% of stops. Um, calls for service were a, a topic of interest uh, last year, and they remain so this year. Um, and similar to the first year of data collection, we see that officers reported making uh, about 5% of the stops that they initiated in response to a call for service, radio call, or dispatch, with the remaining 95% of stops uh, uh, being what we call officer-initiated stops. And because CHP constitutes a majority of the data and tends to make uh, calls for service less often, uh, when we exclude them from the uh, analysis here, we see that this number goes from 5% calls for service and doubles to 10% overall, although the within-agency variance there uh, ranges uh, quite a bit. Um, so many agencies do have higher uh, instances of calls for service, but on average, this is what we see in the data. Um, over here, the next uh, portion is about actions taken during stop. There are 23 different actions taken and officers can select any number of combinations of those actions, reportable actions. Um, officers indicated that they took a reportable action towards 19% um, of the individuals um, in the data set for 2019. What we have here is a graphic that just goes over the four most commonly selected um, actions taken during stop. Um, and so we can see here that the most common type of action the officers indicated having taken uh, was uh, either a search of the person or their property, followed by a detention. And these are what this refers to as a patrol car detention or a detention on the curb, a curbside detention, followed by handcuffing and then ordering the individual to exit their vehicle uh, at about 4% of cases. Uh, I'll note that all other actions taken um, happened in 2% or less of interactions between law enforcement and community members. Um, and some of the actions not covered here uh, constitute uses of force. And we do have some analyses that um, examine those actions taken during stop. That's in a later section of this presentation and Trent will talk about some of those. I just have one more uh, slide before I turn it over to Trent to talk about some of the test for disparities here. 
and that's to examine the results of stock. So there are 11 different results of stock categories. Um, the three most commonly selected ones by officers were um, issuing warnings, giving citations, and making arrests. Citations were the most common occurring in over half of cases. Uh, issuing warnings, either verbal or written, occurred in roughly a quarter of cases, and officers made either a custodial arrest or issued an in-field site and release for an arrestable offense um, in 11.3% of cases. And so that's a high-level overview of just some of the information that's contained within the RIPA data set. And so Trent, now I'll pass it over to him, and he'll go over um, some of the tests for disparities that we've included in the report thus far this year. Thanks, Kevin. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Since we are sharing the same presentation, we're going to keep the screen share on Kevin's side, so he'll be advancing the slides for me. But for those of you who don't know, my name is Trent Simmons, and I'm a research associate with the Research Center. Um, and for my portion of the presentation, I'll be taking or talking about our tests for disparities. Um, each of these tests are based on research practices and statistical approaches that are commonly employed in academic literature. Uh, and I do think it's important to note that each test is uniquely useful and limited at the same time. So we attempted to avoid putting too much stock into any one method by employing several. And the first method you see here um, is a comparison between the demographic breakdown of stop data and the residential population information from the American Community Survey. And the purpose of this comparison is to provide a baseline or benchmark from which to compare stop data demographics. Um, using this benchmark, we can provide an estimate of the expected proportion of stops for each racial or ethnic group um, and since California is a large state, we currently only have about 15 of the over 400 law enforcement agencies reporting stop data. So we did take steps to ensure that only residential data from the jurisdictions of the reporting agencies were included here. Um, we also recognize that each agency contributes a disproportionate number of stop records. Uh, for example, as was mentioned earlier, um, California Highway Patrol submitted about 55% of the data for this reporting cycle. So we also weighted the data according to the number of stops each agency submitted. Um, and the results, of, the results of this process are shown here on the screen. Um, the data here indicate that several groups were stopped more frequently than expected based on residential population data, um, including Black, Middle Eastern, South Asian, and Pacific Islander individuals. Um, there are also several groups who were stopped less frequently than expected based on residential population data. And these groups include Asian, Hispanic, multiracial, Native American, and white individuals. Um, for more information, please do see the body of the report in the appendix because they contain several additional statistics that help quantify and contextualize these differences. Um, next slide, please. Our second test is the search and discovery rate analysis, which first compares the rates at which different racial and ethnic groups were searched during their stops, and second, compares the rates at which individuals were searched and contraband or evidence was discovered during their stop. Last year, this test was called the search yield rate analysis, but since then we've received feedback from consultants and board members that using discovery instead may be a bit more transparent and more accurately represent the way in which the data is collected. Um, overall, approximately 11.3% of individuals were stopped were also searched, and of those who were searched, roughly 21.4% had contraband or evidence on their person or property. Uh, we also calculated these statistics for each, for each group, and those results are shown here in the figure. On the left of the figure, you can see the rates at which each group was searched, while on the right, you have the rates at which each group was searched and had contraband or evidence discovered. And what we found is that search rates vary significantly from group to group, while the discovery rates are less variable. Black individuals, for example, were searched at the highest rates, while Middle Eastern and South Asian individuals were searched at the lowest rates. Um, next slide. And on this next slide, we decided to take it a little bit further, and we took the percentages for each group and subtracted the rates for white individuals. So that means that positive values will represent instances where the corresponding rate was higher compared to white individuals, while negative values will indicate lower rates. Um, in academic literature, some researchers have suggested that bias may best be evidenced when the rates of searches and discoveries are inverted, such as when search rates are higher for some groups, but their discovery rates are lower. And we do see this trend overall for three groups this year, including Black, Hispanic, and Native American individuals. Each of these three groups did have higher search rates, but lower discovery rates compared to white individuals. Um, next slide. In addition to the descriptive analyses just presented, we also provide the results from multivariate approaches. Um, the descriptive analyses focus on raw proportions for each group's outcome, but multivariate analyses can take things a bit further and consider the impact of 
and relationship between several variables simultaneously. So multivariate analyses also involve the concept of statistical significance, which can be described as the likelihood that a disparity we find in the data is due to chance. And statistics are all about probability because you really can never buy 100% certainty. Statistics is about managing risk. So for example, I can use the descriptive analyses to decide and show that there are disparities in the rates at which black and white individuals are searched. Um, but how confident am I that my decision is correct? Am I willing to live with a 10% chance that my decision is wrong or about a 50% chance? Um, if I had more data, would that have changed the results? And in many statistical circles, statisticians suggest that a 5% cutoff is reasonable. So if the probability of some disparity being due to chance is less than 5%, then we can say that the finding is statistically significant. Um, it is important to note though, that just because a disparity is not found to be statistically significant, this doesn't necessarily mean that the disparity does not exist. It could just simply mean that we don't have enough data yet. And as more agencies are onboarded into RIPA data collection, we will get more data and be able to replicate these analyses. So with that in mind, we use multivariate analyses to consider the impact of additional variables like age and time um, on racial and ethnic disparities in search and discovery rates. And this analysis was separated into three parts, including first, search rates, second, discovery rates during discretionary searches, and third, discovery rates during administrative searches. And as you know, officers can select up to about 13 different search bases when providing the justification for their search, including criteria like the officer detected the order of contraband or was responding to a search warrant. Um, some of these search bases offer a lot of discretion to the officer in deciding to conduct that search, while others offer very little. Thus, we've defined an administrative search as one that offers little discretion and includes at least one of the following search bases, incident to arrest, vehicle inventory, and search warrant. Um, any search that does not include at least one of these criteria is subsequently defined as a discretionary search. So for all multivariate analyses that I'll talk about in this presentation, we did combine the four least frequently stopped racial or ethnic groups to help increase statistical power. And these groups include Middle Eastern, South Asian, Native American, Pacific Islander, and multiracial multi individuals. Uh, next slide, please. So here you can see the results of these tests. Um, the table only includes the disparities that were found to be statistically significant. The values in the table are percentage point differences compared to the rate for white individuals, while the arrows indicate the direction of the difference. So the first, the search rate for Asian individuals, for example, was 2.1% lower than the rate for white individuals and was statistically significant. As mentioned previously, biased policing may best be evidenced when search and discovery rates are inverted. And like the descriptive analyses, we do see this trend for both black and Hispanic individuals. Both of these two groups did have higher search rates and lower discovery rates compared to white individuals, even after considering these additional variables. Um, there are several other findings here that unfortunately I do not have enough time to review with you today, but they are discussed at length in the report. Uh, next slide, please. This next test is the veil of darkness, which compares the rates at which each racial or ethnic group was stopped during daylight hours compared to nighttime hours. And the test is based on the idea that as daylight decreases, it becomes a bit more difficult to perceive the race or ethnicity of the driver before making the stop. So if a racial or ethnic group of color is more likely to be stopped during daylight hours than nighttime hours compared to white individuals, this may also be indicative of bias treatment. Um, next slide, please. Um, the veil of darkness, like the other tests we've described so far, may best apply to a specific subset of stops made by law enforcement. And these stops include those for traffic violations, stops where officers initiated the interaction, so it excludes call for service, and stops made during the intertwilight period. And the intertwilight period is the portion of the day that occurs in sunlight during one part of the year, but in darkness during another. And you can see this here on the right with this graphic. Plot B, for an example, shows the evening intertwilight period. And you can see that in June, sunset and the end of civil twilight occurred somewhere between 8.30 and about 9 o'clock p.m. But in most of December, civil twilight ends much earlier in the day, around five o'clock. Thus, the evening intertwilight period includes all stops that occur between about five o'clock and nine o'clock. Um, and of course, this will vary from location to location, and that's been considered in this analysis. And this, of course, excludes all of those stops that took place between sunset and the end of civil twilight, where lighting conditions is a bit more ambiguous. Um, the same applies for the morning intertwilight period, which includes stops from about 5 o'clock a.m. and 7 o'clock a.m. in this case with Sacramento. 
Um, each dot on this graphic represents a single stop made in Sacramento on a particular day and time, and stops made after the end of Civil Twilight have been colored dark blue to indicate that they were made during nighttime. Um, stops made before sunset have been colored light blue to indicate that they were made in daylight. And the proportion of these stops in daylight were compared to the proportion of these stops in nighttime between each individual racial ethnic group of color and white individuals. Now, next slide. Um, and using multivariate analyses again, we found that darkness decreased the rates at which black, Hispanic, and individuals who were grouped together um, into another category were stopped in comparison to white individuals. In other words, individuals from these three groups were more likely to be stopped during portions of the day when it is easier to perceive their race or ethnicity. Uh, we repeated these analyses without data for California Highway Patrol since they do occupy such a large portion of this data. And we continue to see the same disparities for black and Hispanic individuals specifically. Next slide. Our fourth and final test for disparities was for the rates at which force was used by officers during stops. And overall, roughly 1% of stops included some type of forceful action by officers. And we approached potential disparities in use of force rates between these different groups in two ways. First, we identified the actions officers reported for RIPA that did involve force and categorized them into a use of force continuum that was adapted from the National Institutes of Justice. Second, we used multivariate approaches to test for disparities and use of force rates between individual groups of color and white individuals. Next slide, please. There are 23 reportable actions in RIPA data, and nine of them constitute a type of force. These nine actions were split into three categories of force based on their severity, including lethal, less lethal, and other physical or vehicle force. Um, lethal force includes only firearm discharge. Less lethal force includes actions where officers used less lethal tools like batons, chemical sprays, or electronic devices. And other physical or vehicle force includes all other forceful actions like when a person is removed from a vehicle by physical contact or forcibly tackled. And next slide. So on this slide, you can see the relative frequency of each type of force used by racial or ethnic group. And in this case, um, limited force, you'll notice on the X axis of that top figure um, is the same as other physical or vehicle force. We've gone through a couple of different iterations of titles for that category. And I apologize that that figure has not been updated. Um, but that is the same as other physical or vehicle force. Um, in both the top and middle graphs, though, you can see roughly similar trends, namely black individuals have the highest rates of these types of force used against them, while Middle Eastern South Asian individuals tend to have the lowest rates. However, I do want to provide a quick disclaimer for the bottom figure. Uh, many of the groups in this section of the figure had lethal force used against them in one or two stops, but because their group was stopped less frequently by officers, their rates seem remarkably high. So please interpret the bottom figure with this in mind. And we do make a point in the draft to discuss the raw counts and the relative frequencies in the same breath. And so that's all taken into consideration in the draft of the report. Um, next slide. And like with the other analyses, we once again use a multivariate analysis to measure the impact of additional variables on these disparities. And in this case, all types of force were grouped together and disparities in use of force generally were measured between groups. And for this analysis, we only included cases where an action was taken during the stop. And next slide. So the analysis showed that all racial or ethnic groups of color were more likely to have force used against them compared to white individuals. And excluding California Highway Patrol from the analysis had very little impact on these disparities. Uh, this concludes my portion of the presentation, so I'll turn the remaining time back over to Kevin. Great, thank you, Trent. Appreciate you taking that session. Um, so the last portion of the analyses that's included in the draft and distributed in advance uh, looks at some the issue of intersectionality and there's a definition on this slide here for anyone who's concept as well as a graphic here. Um, I'll note that the graphic is not specific to RIPA data. Um, this is a stock image, but it does illustrate the issue of overlapping identity types um, creating different intersection identity types. Um, and so, we, for example, in the RIPA data, we don't have a nationality variable, um, but this, so we have six uh, identity types in the RIPA data, which would actually mean that there are more intersections than in this graphic. And so um, we had to choose at the beginning, obviously we, we cannot uh, perform 
analyses on every single intersection between all of the identity types in one report. And so uh, we selected two for start to start um, and give some people some ideas about how intersectionality could be addressed in the data. And so the first intersection we selected was uh, race and gender because uh, uh, race and gender both received many mentions in the report last year, or sorry, not in the report, but in, in conversations in board meetings and subcommittee meetings. So we thought that gender was going to be a good thing to intersect with race and do some analyses by. And then the second one was race and disability. And of course, that being informed by the uh, mental health and law enforcement encounter uh, presentation that occurred at the last calls for service subcommittee meeting. And so there's already been some discussions around um, mental health conditions in this year's report um, and mental health conditions are captured in the disability variable in the RIPA data. And so we thought that this uh, also stand out item where we could uh, perform some intersectional analyses. And so what we've done here is we've adopted an approach that Trent just presented uh, looking at uh, search rates and search discovery rates, but also breaking it down by more than just race in, in, in these examples. And so what we do here is that on the left, you'll notice this looks very similar to something Trent already uh, presented. Here we have search rates in the graphic on the left and then discovery rates uh, in the graphic on the right. Um, and each of the bars here represents the relative rate for um, individuals of the given uh, race or ethnicity. And then they're broken into clusters by the perceived gender of those individuals. And again here, um, we did have to categorize some groups uh, together for statistical power. Um, same as in other analyses, because we do run some models on it. And what we see here overall, there's a lot going on here, but some overall um, observations that are easy to make uh, just from looking at this is, is, do you see that there's just far more variance in the search rates in the left graphic than there are in actual discovery rates of, of contraband or evidence during these searches in the right graphic? And so we see here uh, that discovery rates generally about are about uh, 20 percent plus or minus three percent um, as a general rule here whereas uh, when we look at uh, the search rates they range from below five percent for some um, groups and above 35 percent for others and what we also notice here is that transgender and gender non-conforming individuals have um, much higher search rates uh, than individuals from the same race ethnicities um, that are perceived to be cisgender male or cisgender female uh, despite that, they also have very comparable discovery rates, um, despite being searched far more often uh, in the data. And we also see the trend that um, black, in, uh, sorry, um, male individuals tend to be searched more for, uh, often than female individuals. Another trend that we see is that um, regardless of, of their gender, black and Hispanic individuals um, are searched at a higher rate than white individuals from the same respective gender. And we also see here, which is um, somewhat atypical, um, given the other groups, that um, whereas most male individual rates are higher than the rates for females, in the case of black um, cisgender females, their rate is actually higher for search rate than um, even uh, white cisgender males. So those are some quick takeaways from this type of comparison here. Uh, I also have another slide here that uh, shows a similar uh, graphic to what Trent went over uh, before, but again here we see a few instances in which we see that the search rate is higher for a group um, where their discovery rate is lower, and so that's the case for uh, black, uh, sorry, in reference to white individuals of the same gender. And so uh, you see that is the case for black and Hispanic cis cisgender females. You also see that that's the case for black and Hispanic uh, cisgender uh, males here in raw terms. Uh, similar to other uh, the analyses that Trent presented earlier, we also ran uh, similar statistical models here. Um, and again, there were a lot of statistically significant um, results when we ran these models. Um, and there's a more robust conversation about these results in the report than we have time for here because we want discussion of um, all of the report sections at the end here. So, but I will just quickly note that that um, trend that Trent talked about of higher search rates, but lower discretionary discovery rates. We observe that for um, both black and uh, Hispanic cisgender males when compared to white cisgender males. Moving on, we also re replicated these analyses now looking at race and disability. 
Um, again, we had to group some of the groups that uh, didn't have as many cases together for statistical power. And so um, on the disability variable, we have mental health condition. Um, individuals who are perceived to have a mental health condition, given that they were actually constituted the majority of individuals who perceived to have a disability. And then we have the other disability types and individuals who are perceived to have multiple disabilities categorized in the other disability category, as well as individuals who are perceived to have no disability. In the category. And what we see here is um, somewhat similar to what we observed in the gender uh, breakdowns, where we do see um, a bit more variance in search rates um, when we look on the left side of this graphic here than we do in the discovery rates. Um, although we do see a bit more variance in discovery rates here in that um, for individuals for uh, that were uh, perceived to have other disability types or no disability, you see that their rates generally hover around 20% of for contraband or evidence discovery. Uh, however, for individuals perceived to have a mental health conditions, their rates, regardless of um, their race, fall below 15% in all cases. Um, this, despite the fact that uh, individuals perceived to have a mental health condition had search rates that ranged anywhere from around 45% to 55%, which is far more than any other group that we've um, in, in these analyses thus far. And so that's stark contrast to the rates for individuals with no disability, which generally have between lower than 10 and 20% search rate. Uh, individuals perceived to have other disability types that were not, uh, that fell in between uh, the rates for mental health, individuals perceived to have a mental health condition and those with no. Um, and again, here we observe the trend that um, in all in all cases, uh, individuals perceived to be black or Hispanic uh, and possess either a mental health condition and other disability or no disability at all have higher search rates than individuals um, from their same group uh, that were perceived to be white. Um, and here we have uh, a graphic um, it just displays all of these great differences relative to white individuals of the same um, disability type in classification. I'll note here that in the actual draft content in the report that was sent out, um, there is a there, there is an error with the sizing of the bars for this no disability group on this graphic, and so um, that is being revised in the, the next version of the report, and so uh, the department is aware of uh, that error there. So it's displayed correctly on the screen here. Um, right now, but if you're flipping through the report as we're going through this, you may notice that these that the bars look different on this graphic on page 43, and um, we're going to be correcting that moving forward. Hey, Kevin. I think, yes. I think some people are having a little difficulty. Um, could, is there a way that we could incorporate this, the rest of your presentation, into the discussion of the report? Um, we are running a little late as well. Absolutely, yeah. There's, I had one more slide after this, and then was just going to talk about some of these. Okay, I, I apologize. This has been very um, fascinating and really informative, um, so, so I apologize. But we, there were some comments that you were being hard to hear, here, so I didn't know if oh. you needed to um, check your reconnectivity and maybe continue the discussion while we're doing the um, the discussion of the report. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I apologize if I'm having any other issues here. I wasn't aware. Um, so, uh, yeah. Thank you. I'm going to end the presentation. I have one more slide. Like I said, it was just going to go over the multivariate analysis. A few more things, but um, that was the end of my presentation. Then we can get to the discussion. I know that we're running. Uh, Nancy, do we want to? Um, well, thank you, Kevin. Do we want to ask board members if they want? Well, Kevin can't answer questions because of his audio issues, it sounds like, or can't with good audio quality. So should we move on to public comment and then that come back to this? And, and maybe Kevin can log off and log back in. If, I know some other individuals in the audience are having trouble, but that seems to help. So um, I think that's a great idea, Sahar. We'll, we'll go to public comment and then um, you can take, we can, we can take questions during the, the discussion of the report. Yeah, and um, given that we are running behind, are we okay with shortening our break to 15 to 20 minutes? Yeah. Okay, we'll do 15. I, I okay. It's really important, especially on these video yeah. meetings, how to end on time. It gets, there's all kinds of studies about how it impacts your brain, but <laughs> you all have good brains. So, 
<laughs> for the sake of everybody's brains, we'll take a 15 minute break. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so public comment. Um, I understand DOJ is going to ha handle facilitation of this, so I'm going to hand it over. Yes, if, if, if there's anybody um, who is interested in public comment, please raise your hand. You'll have one minute. Does the public know how to raise their hand? That's a great question. If you go to the three dots next to your name, um, there's a little hand function and you can just raise your hand and just click on that hand. We have someone who is ready to make a public comment. Yes, I see people doing it. This is, it's like watching election returns come in. <laughs> it's exciting. Um, a Tiffany Carter is up. Ms. Carter, once you're once you're um, invited into the chat, you have to respond. There. Ms. Carter. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon. I caught myself. I was going to say good morning. Um, I simply wanted to um, introduce myself. My name is Tiffany Carter. I am the statewide advocacy liaison with Cal Voices, um, which is uh, the oldest continuously operated consumer run advocacy organization in California. Um, our program, Access to Opportunity, is the newly awarded contractor for the Lived Experience Project with uh, CCJBH, and just really wanted to express our enthusiasm and looking forward to collaborating and providing mental health consumer voice um, in this conversation regarding lived experience of youth and adults with mental health challenges or substance use disorders in the criminal justice system. Um, have thoroughly loved the presentation thus far, looking forward to um, participating in future meetings and just wanted to encourage you all to continue doing the wonderful work that you're doing and, and looking forward to continuing to collaborate with you. So, um, I believe our our next um, commenter is Mr. Richard Hilton. Um, this is Pashi Walker. Can you hear me? Oh yes. Sorry, Ms. Walker. That's okay. They told me I was next, but then you said Richard Hilton. <laughs> I'm not Richard. Hi. Yes, you are next. So okay, hi. Um, thank you very much. My name is Pashi Walker. I am the LGBTQ program director for Cal Voices. Um, and I, first of all, want to echo Tiffany's comments and thank you so much for such a great presentation. I want you to know that I spend most of my time having to uh, say, could you please include sexual orientation and gender identity? And I'm so thrilled to see that that um, LGBT has been included in a lot of your research. I also want to thank the presenter for saying the term cisgender with and, and assuming that everyone knew what he meant. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing more um, as these meetings go on. I do want to bring up one thing that I'm not sure is included in your report. We, um, as a part of our Out for Mental Health project, did a, um, a, a roundtable with um, LGBTQ sex workers and what we heard overwhelmingly was um, the problems that they have with law enforcement and violence and that they cannot go to law enforcement for help because the law enforcement will also then abuse them, et cetera. And I'm, I'm not sure if you've looked at uh, the intersection of um, community complaints um, and sex workers, since I don't know that they would feel safe to make a complaint. 
So I just would like to bring that up as something perhaps for the future. And if there's any way that I can help you or show you our findings, I would be happy to share. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next presenter. Hi, uh, my name is Stephanie Ramos. I'm not sure if I'm next. I wasn't told. And I have a baby and dogs, so I'm hoping to get through this very quickly. Um, I just had a few comments earlier talking about the civilian investigators. I was wondering um, if the demographics of those groups reflect uh, the community and having lived experience with mental health um, and law enforcement. And I know that um, some folks said that, you know, not all communities have that, but I just wanted to stress the importance of that considering a lot of um, communities don't necessarily trust um, systems, whether that be law enforcement or other systems. So I'm hoping that's considered. Um, and then when talking about the calls for service and um, sharing about the mental health presentations, I also wanted to um, just keep in mind that there's a lot of uh, mobile teams that are now including individuals um, in peer support roles where they have their own experience um, navigating mental health and law enforcement, and they're able to bring that um, to the team and help build connections with people in the community that uh, law enforcement might be having contact with. Um, and some of the counties are actually funding that through uh, their Mental Health Services Act funds, also known as Prop 63. So that might be um, some funding to look at on the local level if there's any interest there. So thank you. Next presenter, please. Richard Hilton, you are up. Uh, Richard Hilton, we'll give you one more chance. If not, then we'll move on to Ava. Hi, everybody. This is Ava Bitran, staff attorney uh, with the ACLU of Southern California. Thank you so much to the board and to the Department of Justice for their presentations and for this opportunity to make comment. I was so thrilled to see the intersectional analysis in the draft report, so thank you so much for that. Um, I wonder whether the DOJ is planning to include breakdowns of the data by agency as across uh, analyzed across some of these factors, whether in a, a technical report or in the main report. Uh, and if not, whether that would be on open justice down the line, and if not, whether there might be some tools for other people to replicate this analysis by agency. Thank you as well for including the distinction between discretion and administrative searches. Um, and I noticed that the definition of administrative search is tethered to department policy, if I'm not mistaken. I wonder whether this leads to disparities across departments and how things are being categorized. Uh, that's a question that I had. And, I was also glad to see Chief Swing raise the question of probation and parole and which category they fall into. Um, as the ACLU has advocated in years past, it seems especially critical to consider stops where the officer may have imposed consequences based on officer safety. So I'd be curious to see those. Um, and then look, oh, go ahead. Thank you. We apologize, but your time is up. Thank no problem. Your, thank you. Preparing to hear from the next speaker. Thank you so much. Next speaker, please. Uh, Stacy, you are up. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Richard. Time and date should be used to do that. Thank you. <clears throat> Richard, it, it appears that uh, you were muted when you were speaking. Would you mind go ahead and, and say that again? You're live now, Mr. Hilton.
Uh, next up, we have Stacy Hiramoto. Hi, this is Stacy Hiramoto. I'm oh. with RIMCO, the Racial and Ethnic Mental Health Disparities Coalition. I'm part of the mental health community that is observing your meeting and very impressed with what we've seen. Um, I did want to just introduce myself and mention that um, the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission did do a law enforcement and mental health report that you might be interested in. However, they did focus groups with the African American community and transgender community that were not well documented in that report. So if you want that information, I'd be happy to get that to you. But again, thank you for allowing us to be at your meeting. Next speaker, thank you so very much. Karen Glover has to accept on her side. She's um, she's not connected yet. Okay. Is Mr. Hilton available? Karen, you have to you have to accept the prompt to let you in. Okay, Karen, you are up. Hi folks, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. This is Karen Glover, and I have five quick points. Thank you for all your work. Um, the earlier uh, discussion about early interventions uh, talked, uh, talked about how the best practices needed clear policies, and one of the specific mentions was about subsequent actions on officer behavior. And I'm not sure there were clear policies on specific actions um, in earlier RIPA reports. That was kind of a vague area. That was point one. Uh, second point is, based on your earlier discussion, there really needs to be a, a, a similar universal definition of what a complaint is. Otherwise, you're doing apples and oranges if you don't get these basic kind of definitional things down. If you're trying to do comparative analysis, your comparative analysis will not work. One issue when I was doing some uh, research earlier was uh, just a, a small story. A police chief, when he came in, made... Excuse me, Karen, I'm so sorry, but we apologize, but your time is up. Thank you for your comments, and feel free to submit additional comments on the, the email at ab953 at doj.ca. Thank you so very much. And we need to prepare for the next speaker, please. Looks like that is everyone that we have for this go around. Thank you very much. And there will be a second public comment period. Um, we apologize for the technical difficulties that people are having. Uh, and we hope that you will be able to participate in the next session um, as well. And, and don't please, please don't forget um, AB953 at doj.ca.gov. Um, you can also comment there. All right, so I believe it is time for our break. Let's have everybody back at 1.15 to get started as we don't have much time left. Thank you, and thank you to the members of public for your comments. They're very much appreciated and taken into account.